So I want to ask you, we, we continue in our series called The Grand Story Here to, uh, Told, and I want to ask you to turn in your Bible or go into your, your uh, Bible app on your phone to John 17. John 17. We're going to read from verse um, uh, 15. I just want to make sure that I have the right one here. Uh, so my Bible's not marked. If you just go to my scripture, you're on my tablet. From verse 20, sorry, from verse 20 to verse 23. So um, I just want to recap as your page to that space, John 17, verse 20. Um, a recap on last week's message. Now, if you have not listened to last week's message, please go to our Facebook, go and listen to it. It was an excellent message on, on how we put stuff in our lives in two boxes. Uh, because we, 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 we tend to put everything in our boxes. We have a box for Christianity, we have a box for family, and, and what we put into that box would be what we have learned from life, from the lessons we've learned, the information we get, got. And then we would write those lessons, those rules almost into those boxes, and that determines how we view life, view relationships. View Christianity. I just want to really invite you, but just a highlight on on that message that uh, that I really want to to highlight um, today is the thing about um, are you viewing your Christianity through a lens, or is it written in your box that Christianity is a bunch of rules, a bunch of rules, laws, commandments, stuff that I need to do to get God's attention, to get His acceptance? How, how do you view Christianity? How do you view your relationship with God? I, I want to really invite you to struggle with this question and go deeper into that because if you can answer that question, it will show you why you sometimes struggle to trust God. Why you sometimes feel far away from God. Why you sometimes feel that you cannot hear God's voice. How do you use it? And I've put it on a board there. It says, you know, war stands for we are right. If we think it's about being right, it's about being rules. You know, because as Christians, a lot of times we think we have the, uh, uh, sort of a, a vantage point about everyone else. We have this moral superiority because I'm a Christian and the rest are bad. And I'm right and they're wrong. What's going to happen is that's what they're going to write in there. Christianity box. They're wrong. We think they're wrong. That's what create war. People think they're right. That's why you would argue with your wife because you think you're right. Am I right, guys? Yes. And that's why your wife would argue back because she thinks it's right and she's right. And then it becomes a war. And we need to actually change that lettering on that to the following because we, we are in war with the wrong understand. So before I go on, who likes it here to be called wrong? Somebody, somebody walk up to you, you make a statement and they say, you're wrong. Okay, John is one of those guys that, that loves to be wrong. Okay. So, I mean, who does not defend themselves when somebody say you're wrong? No one. Why? Because none of us likes to be wrong. And a lot of us, we think that I'm right because the information I have says, says I'm right. So if you would speak to people about anything, politics, anything, you would find that people go into arguments, heated arguments. Why? Because their belief would be right and the other person would be wrong. Have you ever found that you have been convinced of something after somebody said you're wrong? Have somebody had changed your mind by opening like this. You know, Ian, you're wrong. You're so wrong. You're so out of it, Ian. You don't know what you're speaking about. Have you ever changed your mind when somebody did that? But if somebody would come up to you and say, wow, you know, I listen to what you have. And, but have you read this new information? There's, there's a new article. Um, you know, this new discovery. Have you read this article with this new discovery in it? Because it seems that the information that you have has been outdated. Would you then listen to someone? You see, the problem is that we have is that none of us wants to be wrong. We don't like it to be wrong. 
We don't like it when people say that we're wrong. And that's what's so important about Daniel's message. It's not that when we try to convince people about Christ and the truth and the good news of Christ, it's, it's not from a point of view that I am right and they are wrong and they need to get this. No, it's that the information they have might be outdated, might be wrong because of our experiences. One, one of the things that I've found is that sometimes we write in our Christianity box that God is a God of rules. You know, that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. And Jesus corrected them. He said, you're trying to teach people to follow God but you're actually making them slaves of rules. So have you ever considered that the way you look at Christianity might be because of the experiences and the lessons and the things that you've been taught? And might it be possible that you're looking at Christianity through the wrong lenses? Not understanding what the gospel really means. The good news is only good news if it's good news. Uh, okay, let me explain it this way. Say, for instance, Nick, uh, is, you know, he comes up and he stands, he takes a mic and says, he has great news, everyone. Uh, I've just, uh, you know, uh, inherited a million dollars. That's good news for Nick. Is it good news for you? No. It's, Nick's going to say it's good news, but you're going to say, that, I can, you know, it's good news, but how do I benefit from it? But if he gets up and says, you know, guys, I've inherited a million dollars and I'm going to give each one of you equal shares. That's good news, am I right? And everyone would say, yes, that's good news. And a lot of times we take the gospel that's good news and we say it's good news for me, but bad luck for you. We limit the good news to, to a certain set of rules. We say, you know, if there's good news, Christ has uh, died for you. He's here to redeem you, but you need to change your attitude. You need to change your behavior. You need to change everything. And I want to, this morning, uh, go into a space where uh, I want to invite you, where we take the war, we are right, so we are righteous. And just want to uh, put a footnote to the uh, righteous there. It's not my righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. That makes me righteous. It's Christ's righteousness. This morning when I had this on Old Testament, we didn't make that amount of harsh noises. So 2 Corinthians 5 21 states the following. We are righteous. We want to change our wrong understanding of what scripture says. We want to change the understanding that we need to do the wrong things so that we can become righteous. This is not what the scripture says. 2 Corinthians 5 21 says, For our sake, he, that's the Father, made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And most of our Christianity boxes, we have this list of things that we need to do to make sure that we are righteous. You're not allowed to swear, not allowed to smoke, not allowed to drink, not allowed to do all these things. Because that would show my righteousness. And, and it's something I work on. It's not something who I am. And then all of a sudden you fail. And I remember growing up, I was going to a church. And each Sunday they would take the Ten Commandments and read them to show us how we failed God. And then did a prayer so that you know, God would forgive us. And then a sermon on God's judgment on all these things that we've just done wrong this week. With an ending prayer of just God, just help us not to fail again. And then it comes to a place where we think it's all about what I do that would call me for making me righteous. But if you read this scripture, it says, For this our sake, he to, made him to be sin who need no sin. There's something about the scripture that's really important to understand. Jesus had no sin. He was born from a, a virgin. This important, and that's a, a new, a whole new topic, but it's important to understand he had no sin at all. But to pay the price for us, he had to be burdened with our sins. He had to be, he had to carry our sins. He had to become 
our sins. There's an exchange happening here. He had no sin. Just as I have no righteousness within me, Jesus had no sin within him. But for us to become righteous, Jesus had to become our sin. This exchange, nothing that I did, Jesus didn't do sin. Nothing he did made him to have sin or be sin. It's something that happens, a transaction from the Father, so that we can, nothing that I do can make me righteous. So that I can be righteous. So important to understand this part. And then uh, another scripture I have just to, to sort of uh, go out and, 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 and explain this better is one, in Ephesians 1. Uh, three to five, and this is from the Passion Translation. Um, and just listen to what he says in DOP. It's all right. It says, Every spiritual blessing in heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderful Father, Heavenly Father. The Father, our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped into Christ. That is why we celebrate it with all our hearts. Nothing that I have done can make me righteous, can be right. It's because what of Christ has done. Because Christ became my sin, I can become his righteousness. Really important to understand, guys. And in love, he chose us before he laid the foundation of the universe. So it started before anything was created. God knew that he's going to have to sacrifice his son. To pay the price that we can be righteous in Him. Because of this great love, He ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in His eyes with an unstained innocence. This is really important. Because for years in the Christianity box, we thought we are this ugly, distasteful thing in God's eyes that he's frowning upon us he wants to just hit us with the stick because he's actually not in any way happy with us he's so concerned about our sin that he's waiting for us to do the sin so he can correct us it's not what the scripture says to me it says God before you were created before the world was created already had a plan in place so that you could walk in his holiness. So that you could be called his righteousness. Because of his great love, he ordained us so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with unstained innocence. For it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children. Wow. Have you ever seen yourself as someone that God delights in? Do you struggle with your inner capabilities and, and your shortcomings and your issues that you feel that God is not pleased with? You see, that's one of the things where we have been told that God is not pleased with us. And therefore, we need to do a lot of things so He can be pleased with us. And we go into this cycle of shamefulness, and we feel shameful, of regret, of pain. God wants to change that. That's why Jesus came. He never came so that we could be judged. He came so that we could be free. If we uh, continue reading, it's for it, was, it was always in His perfect plan to adopt us as His delightful children through our union with Jesus. Again, it's not us, it's Jesus, the anointed one, so that His tremendous love that escapes over us would glorify His grace. For the same love he has for the beloved Jesus, he has for us. He has for us. And this unfolding plan brings him great pleasure. So what I'm trying to do is here to help you to understand, to go and read the Bible through a different lens. Because we have been told that we read the Bible through the lens of God's word. Through him being angry with us, upset with us. And then we need to do all these things as the Israelites have done. Because they did offerings and they did all these things. So that they can be in God's good books. God has made one offering once and for all. 
so that we can be united with Him. No office needed anymore. God has changed our position from this shameful thing to a son and a daughter. And actually, He revealed in us through what Christ has done that the humans, the humankind, He loved them so much. That he would pay the So to, this morning, if we go to our theme scripture, there's an illustration I want to show you on, on what happened with us because it's it, we need to take this new information and put it into our Christianity box and rewrite everything that we have believed that has been formed in there so that we can adjust our way we live. I, I want to say something. If you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And what we have done in our Christianity box is we have put in a lot of things in, say, if I do these things, if I can just do these things, you know, it will show who I am. I need to adjust my behavior so it can show that I'm a Christian. It's not true. I need to make sure that my heart and my mind is one with Christ, and that will adjust my behavior. We do not need to behave in modification. We need to change the hearts. I want to invite you to, to, to ponder on this. If you know who you are, you know what to do. Let's just read together John 17 from verse 20. It says, Jesus, and I call it the high priestly prayer, uh, just before uh, uh, his, his uh, crucifixion, everything he prays this uh, prayer. It says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. He's, he's speaking about his disciples, and then he says, that they will be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. It's really important that you hear this. As you, Father, are in me, Jesus speaking, and I in you, that they also might be one in us. That the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you, you gave me, I have given them. That's just a strange concept. If your Christianity box is uh, 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 you know, full of rules. How, how can I have God's glory? How can he be in me and I'm in him, it's impossible. Because the scripture says no one that's not holy can see the glory of God. How is this possible? We'll get to it in a second. So he said, and the glory which you have gave me, I've given them that they may be one just as we are. I in them, you in me that they might be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved me as you have loved me. Or that love you as you have loved me. So here's something I want to ask you. Just don't read this whole chapter on your own time because there's a lot of uh, pieces of, of gold and diamonds of of scriptural uh, teaching in this uh, piece of scripture, but I want to highlight something just to make it clear, just to make it understandable. If you look at my, my Tupperware set, so my question would be in this service, or this service, what's in the box? If I would look at this, and I would ask you to read what it says. You see sin. And that's a lot of times when we look at ourselves, that's our identity, sin. And then within there, right behind that, that there would be me. And but, but if you look inside, then you would see sin. And that's where we start before what Jesus does for us. Before we get saved. Before we go to Jesus and say, just take over my life. This is who we are. We have, in this box, we our identity found in sin. And a lot of times when we get saved, we stay in this box in our minds. Although God has changed it spiritually, we stay in this box. So we think we need to do something, you know, I don't know if it happens to you, but, you know, quite often we, when you drive, you, 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 there's something happening, you, you have a flat tire or whatever, you think, oh, maybe it's because I didn't do that, or I, I kicked the neighbor's cat and that's a sin, or whatever. And because we're in this box. 
But if you read about, you know, God giving us His righteousness because He has taken our sin, what He actually did is heart surgery. He changed it. He took us out of sin. And He took sin out of us. Now, just to explain this, identity, not actions. Because we tend to do the wrong thing still. Because we miss what happened to us. That's why Romans 12 says, renew your mind. But he takes this out of us, and if we read and apply this scripture, it says that Jesus, it says Jason because I couldn't write out Jesus. Okay? Just Jesus is now in me. Okay? So I can close me. So you still see me here. But Jesus in me, but it doesn't stop there. It says, no, 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 wait. I am in Jesus, Jesus in me, so I am in Jesus. Okay, Jesus is up there, there you go. Alright, I am in Jesus. But it doesn't stop there because I, Jesus is in me, I am in Jesus, and Jesus is the Father. And all of a sudden my identity changes from this bad person, sinner, to Jesus in me. I'm in Jesus. And Jesus is the Father, and this is what God sees when He looks at you. He doesn't see your sin. He's dealt with that. He doesn't call you sinner. He doesn't call you bad person. He calls you your, His child, His daughter, His, his son. He calls you His friend. So if we still think we need to attain our righteousness, follow a bunch of rules to put God in you know, His wrath to start to appease Him, to, to get His acceptance, then, then we do not understand this. We do not understand. So if we go and read it, and a lot of people get stuck in Romans 3.23, uh, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's true. Everyone has. But then something happened to us. Something happened. God sent His Son so that we who are not righteous can become His righteousness, nothing other. Everything He did. Because if you read Romans 3.24, it says, And we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So if you read the scripture, it again is what happens when I get saved, when, when there's new birth, redeemed uh, through the love of God. It's Christ takes up this heart of stone, Ezekiel. He gives us a heart of flesh. Jesus comes into us. He lives within us. And I live within him. I'm actually totally lost in God. If you think about it. Because you can see me in this box. I can see Father, I can see Jesus, but I cannot see you. It's not something I've done or I need to achieve or work towards or work on my righteousness, my actions. And again, I want to say, if you understand this, it's going to affect the way you live. It's not a license to do what you want to do. It's actually a revelation to let us say, I don't have to do these things. There's something that changed with us the day that we got saved. I want to maybe challenge the, the rules mindset, that Christian box a bit more. If the Holy Spirit then lives in us, but Scripture says that no one that's unholy can enter God's throne room, and then the Scripture also says that the Holy Spirit in us would never go away, What happens? Why? How is it possible that the holiness of God can live within me? If I am this identity, sinful person. I'm not speaking about actions. I'll get to that in a second. There's something that changed within us because of what Jesus did. And all of a sudden I have this boldness to enter the throne room of God and say, you know, I've messed up today, but I'm so sorry. And then the word says, he's faithful to forgive us. But more than that, he looks at us not through the lens of sin, but through the lens of his son. 
We don't have to follow a bunch of rules. We just need to stand in a relationship. A relationship changes us. If you've been taught that to be a Christian, to you know, to be this this person, you need to live a life of righteousness. So you need to work on your actions. You're going to miss it. Because righteousness, oh, the battery is dead. Righteousness doesn't come from our actions. Just as Jesus did no sin, but still was seen as uh, you know, carrying our sin, we are Christ's righteousness because of what he did. And it's important to understand that why. Because we live from acceptance. The Father accepted you. He dearly loves you. He really loves you dearly. He really wants you to understand that. Because if we continue to live in a space where we think that is not just part of the So if you live in this space, we think God is not, you know, He doesn't accept you, that you're not worth it. I think a lot of times you would look in the mirror and think, you know, I'm just not worth it. You would look in the mirror and say, God is angry at me. You know, and, and I do believe that God gets upset about sin, but the problem is not about sin in the sense of He's angry at humans, and therefore the wrath of God is there for sinners. It's rather because of the pain and the hurt that sin causes his beloved. Mm. That he gets upset about. Mm -hmm. You are God's beloved. You have a new identity. You're not stuck in that space of being called a sinner. Identity again. Because we tend to do sin still. We tend to do the wrong things. Because your nugget, your brain, needs to be Transform. That's what Paul writes. And interesting, if Paul really wanted you to change your habits or your, what you do, he would have written in that in Romans 12. He would have said, and be renewed in your mind and what you do. Or stop doing what you do and renewing your mind. He just spoke about mind. Because there's something that happened in our hearts that needs to get to our minds. And I want to invite you to take the information that you've been given and just compare it to scripture and I want to actually close this message with the following question if you think about the Bible and I would throw a few book names just you don't have to do it out loud but just give you know a moment and think what's the theme of this book what's the main theme of that book so I'm going, to read, I'm going to pull out the book and you can just think that the main theme might have been this. Okay, so let's just go to Genesis. What's the main theme of the book of Genesis? All Exodus. All the book of Revelation. Now I'm, I'm on purpose with this. So here's the thing is that we tend to make a theme, you know, what's going on in the book. Uh, the Revelation is the end times. We need it. But it's actually Jesus. The theme of every book in the Bible is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if we look at through the different, you know, the wrong lens, what's going to happen? We're going to have the wrong information get into our minds. We're going to not renew our minds with the right way of looking at what God has done. We're going to start to be worried about a lot of teachings and stuff. You know, if we don't believe this this way, then then we're wrong. You know, you need to believe that. You know, there's going to be five different actions of the end times. You know, the first one would be this and this and this. And if this happens, then that's going to happen. If you don't believe it that way, you're not going to be raptured. Which isn't true. Because the only, the only thing that I need to know to go to heaven is Jesus. I don't need him to know anything else. And then second to that, it aligns me to live a life of victory in this life. To understand this, I'm a new being in Christ. To breathe in His heart, so I'm a new being because of what He's done. 
So I want to invite you. We're just going to take a moment in pondering on where you're at. What's in your heart of Christianity? I thank you, Father. So I'm going to ask you just for a moment to close your eyes and just think about it. And what's in your heart? How do I see? Do I see God as angry and waiting for me just to do a misstep so He can correct me? You know, is God at war with me or am I at war with the wrong understanding? Is it about relationships or is it about rules? Do I truly believe that God has made me a new being? Do I truly believe that my identity has changed? So maybe just take a moment and, and, and ponder on this. Again, it's not because you are wrong, but so, much, so often we go to places where we are taught, you know, about things. If, if, if you are taught about end times from the book of Revelation, you'll miss Jesus in that book. So most often when we have the wrong belief system or my understanding, it's just because we have the wrong information. And I would invite you all to just change the way you look at Scripture and see the love of God for humankind through all the ages. Christ being revealed in every piece of Scripture. Maybe as you're pondering on it, you might think and realize that you've believed the wrong information. You've been taught quite a few things and, and you got to the wrong conclusion because of that. And maybe it's a good time to say, Father, I, I want to see what you have said through Scripture. Let your Holy Spirit reveal to me my error and many ways, but let me understand this, that you are in me, Jesus, and I'm in you, Jesus, and you're the Father, I'm hidden in God. It's the fullness of Christ that lives in me through all his and I'm totally lost in you. So Father, I pray that as people are pondering on this that your Holy Spirit would let them see the truth revealed through who Jesus is. That we have become your righteousness because Christ became our sin. That you have called us to be holy, not because we are holy, because Jesus in me and I'm in him is holy. That you would see us through that, through your Son. That's why we celebrate this song of Europe. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to earth so that we can be set free. Free from these laws and regulations we need to follow just to appease a God. No, you came so that we not just be judged, but so that we can be saved. Be set free and live in a life victorious. So maybe as you're pondering still, I want to invite you, if you struggle with your relationship with the Father and with Jesus, because you feel that you've done so much wrong that He cannot accept you anymore, He cannot love you, maybe it's, it's, it's a good time now to, just to give that to Him. you have to struggle with the sin in your life, the pain in your life, the shame in your life, He wants to take that away. He wants to replace it. Through His grace, He dealt with your sin. Because of Christ, you are called His righteousness, so you don't have to be ashamed when He enters His presence. And the pain that you have felt with your relationships, especially with God, He addressed with giving you boldness to enter into His presence. Not according to your actions, but according to what He has done. Just 
take a moment and just confess that wrong belief in this moment. So, Father, I want to, you know, I accept that what you've done is a complete action. I don't have to do anything else. There's no extra steps to what you've done on the cross. It's me being found in you. I want to invite you, if you struggle with your relationship with the Father in this moment, please, we, we want to pray with you, we want to speak with you, come and speak to us after the service. We want to pray with you. If you're online watching on Facebook, you're more than welcome to go to our messenger and send us a message. We want to get hold of you and really pray with you and trust with you that you will discover this truth and that it, the box that you have in Christianity will be changed to what the Bible says to the view of Christ and what he has done.